The presenting sponsor of Upmarket is Aereo, the best place to grow and manage your real estate media business, online at aereo.com. That's A-R-Y-E-O dot com. Coming to you from the makeshift Upmarket Studios in the beautiful Ojai Valley of Southern California. This is Upmarket, a podcast about the business of real estate photography and media. My name is Reed Fish. I am the CEO and a co-founder of Upmarket Media. One of our other co-founders, Mark Corcoran, not here today. Chelsea, you know, producing from afar once again. Um, and, uh, you know, we're gearing up. We're getting close now. We are like not that far, just a few weeks away from PMRE 2023. I'm going to be there. Mark's going to be there. We're going to, you know, the upmarket team is going to be there and we are excited and we want you to be there too. It, this is the pre premier uh, event for real estate media professionals. It is the photography and media for real estate conference. It is November 8th and 9th in Las Vegas. I want you to come, but I also want you to save money. So th- through the end of September, which is really coming up, you can use the code upmarket 75 and you can get $75 off your uh, off your registration. That is a great deal. That's the best deal I think you're going to get. Cause this thing is going to sell out. So get in there, get your deal. Now I want to see you in Las Vegas. I want to meet you. I want you to buy me a drink. I want all those good things. So pmreconference.com code upmarket 75. Speaking of PMRE, we have yet again, one of the, one of the speakers, one of the presenters at PMRE. And this time it is David deal who is a lawyer specializing in photography and intellectual property rights. So David, here's the thing I want to ask you first is we've kind of gotten into it uh, a bit on this podcast with uh, about Zillow. And then there's been the whole controversy with Aereo and um, you know, them being bought out by Zillow. But one of the, one of the things that, that we had talked about um, uh, you know, earlier in the, in the beginning of the Zillow controversy is how we feel that Zillow has built their company on the backs of real estate photographers. And they have done that by using our photos and they have not paid a dime to any of us. I mean, how basically have they gotten away with that? And I mean, and would you even frame it like that? You know? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting question. And, and just for a little bit of context, there's, there's the equivalent of a Zillow in in almost every photographic niche. So, you know, the, the, the real estate photography and the architectural photography niche happens to be very large and, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, all over the country, obviously. Uh, and so for for architectural and real estate photographers, Zillow is is like, you know, kind of the the Pinterest uh for, right. uh, you know, for, you know, kind of, uh, f- photographers that photograph, uh, interiors or, or mm-hmm. celebrities on the street. So the Zillow is no different than other large, and I'll, I'll call, uh, Zillow a, a social media company. They're real, they're, they're, they really don't qu- qualify, but they, they function the same way. They, okay. they are, However, they got there. They occupy this overwhelming space in in the niche. So, when people think of when consumers think about uh, viewing, you know, kind of a quick hit on you know, kind of what's mm-hmm. available in your neighborhood, or even if you're a serious shot, you know, in the market for for a home, yeah. you think of Zillow first, and that's a testament to you know the people at Zillow that have, that have built the brand and it, you know, Zillow occupies that space for now. Yeah, for sure. Um, For sure. But Zillow is no different than any other, uh, large, uh, successful social media company in that Zillow itself is not the, the entity that is going out and getting and sourcing the images and copying them mm-hmm. and committing copyright infringement. So it, it makes it, Zillow is a really easy target, but they're not, they, legally speaking, they right. are yes. not the Morally is different than legally. Well, right. And that, that is, <laughs> and you know, I, you know, lots of copyright attorneys, I'm not alone, think that the current boundaries of uh, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act 
should not include companies like Zillow. Um, they right. do, however. And so as long as Zillow uh, is protected under DMCA as a service provider, they mm-hmm. are <clears throat> they are protected from any any infringement that happens to make it onto their platform as long as the, it was subject to the the rules and the protections of DMCA, which means mm-hmm. Zillow can't be the ones that are actively going and getting the images. They have to right. be, you know, there's a, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of summarizing a little bit, but Zillow has to be a passive force in mm-hmm. the 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 gathering or the um, kind of the sure. assembly of these images. So Zillow is an easy target, but it's it, it's it's not necessarily the 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 worst actor in the equation. So the I counsel clients on this this dynamic all the time. In once you once you as a photographer permit your client uh, to upload the images uh, that they have licensed. Mm -hmm. Uh, As long as your agreement with your original client uh, allows for that, then you have given away uh, a, an overwhelming uh, amount of value to your work because pre Zillow uh, you were licensing work to, you know, an agent that was going to sell the home, uh, a builder, somebody that uh, Mm -hmm. had a very limited scope of use. And that's just fine. What the, 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 the problem in the last couple of years is that uh, the terms of the limited license that most photographers grant their original client has not caught, has not kept up with the reality of the way that um, the client used the images. I would argue now it, the, the clients, whether or not they're agents or construction companies or window companies, whoever is is properly licensed in the work, their understanding, right or wrong, is that they can they can upload images to Zillow or they can upload them to House or mm-hmm. and absent absent clarifying language in an, the agreements between photographers and their clients. That's. The, their ability, the client's ability to do that is is an open and unresolved issue. And right. once the images cross that threshold, all hell breaks loose because the uploaders, the users of Zillow mm-hmm. that upload the images are granting Zillow a license to effectively do whatever they want. Right. With the and Zillow is getting value to uploaded the uploaded images because they are they are a content aggregator uh, among other things right and they would have to otherwise go out and affirmatively get all of the all of this information this visual information and they yeah but i think yeah but i i think they're also you know scraping from the mls and or the mls you know that they have the deals with the mls to and, and here's the other the other part of the equation is zillow is also a brokerage and so and i don't know if they have their license in every state but you know i think within those mls's within all that stuff you know you can share i mean the whole point right is 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 you they're trying to sell all this real estate and the agent wants it out on all these different places and so That's right. if you have a brokerage license you're going to be able to to use those photos and it, and it's the same what you just described is the same issue just with a with one more layer to it. So, for example, if a photographer has a has a real estate agent license, they they um, they finish and deliver a job, uh, you know, for a one million dollar house, uh, and those images uh, once in the hands of the agent, uh, the agent uploads the images to Zillow, or um, the the images were were um, properly uploaded to a local MLS system. And that MLS system happens to have a, a deal with Zillow to allow, to allow image sharing. Again, unless the photographer has directly dealt with that, that use, right. the understanding is that the client can, that's permitted. And so the, 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 the breakdown, I mean, the, the, uh, the breakdown is, is partially the fault of, the Zillows of the world or the MLS um, mm-hmm. of the world and Zillow 
as well as the photographers, because if, if you, as a photographer, if you work from the assumption that that's what your clients are going to do, you, you can't have it both ways by, by not addressing it in your agreement with your client mm-hmm. and then complaining they're doing something that you know right. they're going to do. Right. And well, I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't like that because that puts the burden on us and I don't want the burden on us. I want it on other people. I want to be the victim here. Um, <laughs> so I, I, uh, um, you know, but, but I, 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 and I think, and I look at, you know, kind of how I just like in my gut feel about all this stuff. And, and I, to me, like, when the agent licenses these photos from us and, and I, I kind of say, yeah, you know, p- put them wherever to advertise the home and to advertise you alongside that. I mean, cause we really think of ourselves as realtor marketers, not real estate marketers. And so it's really about the agent. That's what, that's who, you know, we want the agent to be successful. We want them to get another listing so that then we can get more work. It's like, I'm fine with them uploading it, you know, either personally or it aggregates off, you know, as long as their name is next to it on Zillow, the, to me, that's okay, right? That, that That's within the bounds of, of what I would think is a reasonable expectation. It's when I look at Zillow and I see photos that I took 10 years ago on there still, and there's no mention at all of the original realtor. And I think what they say is they say, well, you know, there's a checkbox when you upload to the MLS that, you know, for the, for the photos to be taken down when, when the listing ends. And so again, it, it puts the onus on, on to, you know, the realtor who has, and we can tell them a thousand times, they have no concept of copyright law. They don't, it's just not something that enters into their consciousness. And so it, 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 it just becomes a, I don't know, I, I guess what just gets me about it more than anything is it's just like Zillow just is like, well, you know, we have that checkbox. And so, you know, officer, I can't, I can't imagine there's, you know, copyright infringement happening on our website. Oh my goodness. You know, right. when they full well know, it's just, they're, they have right. millions of infringed images and, on their website. And there, there's always, there are always a couple ways to, to solve the problem. And in this, in in this, the, the facts that we've been speaking about, a photographer can can either be proactive about clearly defining kind of the expectations from their client. Um, you know, when things um, go south, even after you have a really good uh, kind of tight contract, you know, the issue of whether or not you want to go after your original client is another issue. You know, that's that's something yeah. completely different. But there's there's that avenue which you know some photographers choose. Or, you know, a, a more efficient way of doing it is making the assumption that you are giving more value to your client than you, than you would have if they didn't uh, get the benefit of, of the images ending up on all these sites and adding to your, adding to your, your fee. And so, you know, and there's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with, with, communicating with your clients that this is, this is why, you know, um, I'm good. We're going to work from the assumption that the images are going to get onto the MLS. They're going to get onto Zillow. They might not be, they might not be removed when they should be removed from Zillow. Um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to work from the position that you as a client are, you know, once this, once this job is come and gone, you know, you're, you're going to do very little, but, and I'm okay with that as long as there's an exchange and the exchange is my fees, my fees are a little bit higher. I mean, that, mm. that's the, that's the more efficient way of, and you know, it built into all of these things is all of our um, desire and willingness to engage in these kind of conversations with our clients. I mean, I shot for 20 years. It's touchy. It's really touchy yeah. bringing things up with your client that, you know, all, all intents purposes holds the power. Yeah. Well, and that, that's, that was kind of be my next question is like, those are, those can be hard conversations to have with our clients when already I feel like so many of them are in a position where they feel like we're screwing them anyway, because we're so expensive and like, wait, I'm paying you all this money and I don't own the images. I mean, how many times have I had that conversation? And, you know, usually you can, you know, usually they come around, but it, it is always awkward. And especially it's awkward when, you know, you know, our business I feel like is in a place now, even though we still feel like we need every single client where like, you know, if someone's putting up a fuss, we can just say, screw it, forget it. We're not going to work with you. But if you're just in the process of building your business, if you're, if you're newer, that's, that's when you're so liable to, to just roll over for people all the time, you know, and sign, signing the copyright away on those, you know, on the agreements that the brokers try to send you and all that, you know? 
Yeah, that that's always been. I mean, that has always been. Real estate photographers are part of the the exact same the exact same discussion. That's always been the 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 dynamic is you know and and it changes. You know, photographers that are mm-hmm. just starting out have different standards than older more experienced photographers. Ultimately, at any given time in your career, a photographer ha- needs to make a decision about what kind of clients you want. And Right. You know, you're at least from from my experience and my perspective now. If you're doing things properly uh, as a as a photographer, you're gradually going to get. You're gradually going to settle on. However, you get there, you're going to settle on less clients that are better clients that pay you more sure. and work efficiently. I mean, that's the direction that every photographer should be going. And this is a conversation I have all the time with my clients, separate from any kind of copyright matters. Is in the end, you know, you want to end up with, ideally, you want to end up with clients that respect you, back you up when something, when something goes wrong Mm -hmm. and, and pay attention to, you know, the terms of the contract. I mean, I I can't tell you how many times I've had clients say, well, we have this contract, we went over it and they broke it. And when I, when I called them on it, they kind of attempt to write it off. I mean, Every photographer is different, but in the end, photographers need to make a decision about what kind of clients they want. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. You know, it's complicated. This, <laughs> you know, n- nothing, nothing is easy. Well, I, okay, I'm going to throw an easier question at you. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 <laughs> um, AI. So, you know, I, I think right in the, obviously it's the buzz everywhere for the last like six months has been AI and, and, and it's been no different in our industry. And, you know, I'm already seeing people, uh, using generative AI in Photoshop, uh, even though it's against their terms of service, uh, you know, using it in commercial work and say, Oh, I look, I raced this car from the driveway and it's so amazing, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I, and I think I, and in, in my cursory reading of headlines lately that I didn't actually click on and read the article, um, a judge ruled that, you know, AI images are not, or AI work is not copyrightable. Right. So are we, you know, where is that going to put us? And obviously this is a really good, new area in the law. But if we, you know, say use Photoshop generative AI in an image and assuming it's within their contract, you know, that they're going to allow it for commercial use at a certain point, then are we then when we're thinking about copywriting our images, are we going to put ourselves in a bad spot where AI went on that image and just erased the leaves in the driveway and then now can we not copyright that image? Do you see a path that that, that yeah. could be the case? I mean, there, there's a really, there, there are two, the, the way, at least currently in the way I, I understand things and, and, and looking forward as, as much as we, any of us can, there, there are two, there are two things going on. There are two, there are two things concerning AI that are going to affect photographers. Um, and one of them is, uh, in a in the bigger picture, uh, at some point, and this is all new law. Like there's nothing on the books that even right. remotely kind of establishes boundaries about th- where this issue is. But f- fundamentally, for AI to function and to be useful for the the person or the entity that is operating the AI system, it 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 relies on. Um, information, whether or not that is, whether or not that is words, whether or not it's music, whether or not it's photography. When, when an AI system that, uh, is programmed to, to produce something from using AI from existing photographs, that issue has not been put before a court yet. How much or how little constitutes infringement? Right. If you are right. if you are putting together an image that's generated by AI that's drawing on 100 existing images, are you infringing um, on all 100 of those images? Uh, mm-hmm. And of those 100 images, how much of each of the image contributes to the the final AI production, yeah. uh, so forth. So. That is going to be the it, it, from a from a legal question. That is going to be the the, the absolutely kind of wonderful, complicated legal issue that's going to have to get worked out because there is a right. threshold, right? If if AI in the end 
uh, uses very little of kind of the 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 base images, then is it infringement? Um, you know, and so the other part of it is uh, the other the other part of AI that's going to affect our industry is uh, it is very clear so far that might change. I don't I don't think it's going to, but so far courts have held that AI generated images are not copyrightable. They have to be the product of an individual. Um, mm -hmm. So the way I see it. It has nothing to do with what we just talked about, but it is AI. And if the, 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 the issue that I see is that AI systems, the more sophisticated they get, the more capable they're going to become uh, producing images that would otherwise be otherwise be produced by a, by a living, breathing photographer mm -hmm. with, with sure. all of his or her expertise. So, they're they're not going to be copyrightable. You know, the entity mm -hmm. that, that that is supervising the or developed the AI that that ends up with these images is not going to be the copyright holder. But that doesn't that doesn't mean anything for photographers that are potentially going to lose out of work, lose out on work mm -hmm. because there's an AI system custom making these scenes that they that they establish the the parameters for. So mm -hmm. it's it's it's. I think it's a win for. Well, I wouldn't. I don't. You're not even sure who it, who it's a win for. The fact that AI generated images can't be copyrighted solves a whole lot of problems because right. you know they're. I, I don't know if they're exactly going to be in the public domain, but they're not copyrightable. Therefore, you can't infringe. Um, that that I think is a whole different thing. But the idea that AI can replace skilled photographers on the ground just by using existing images that are in some giant right. giant right. bank mm -hmm. that's that would be if i was a working photographer that would worry me you know especially mm -hmm. especially as an architectural photographer because you know let's say you are a live events photographer or you know kind of a concert photographer mm -hmm. or like a news photographer ai is really not going to really not going to kind of kind of uh, right. kind of bump you out of your market because there's really no way of predicting and no way of no mm. way of realistically sure. generating an AI image out of something that hasn't happened yet but in terms of kind of stock quality images of homes uh, or interiors or styles I see that as much more applicable to AI and therefore much much more likely to displace working photographers. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and I, I really see it as, I mean, I mean, you still like, no one knows what the inside of my house looks like, right? Because it, no AI is going to know that uh, unless there's, you know, images out there. So, I mean, you know, to me, what the plausible thing is, and there's already apps that do this to a very, very lesser extent is you're just going to be able to have an app on your phone. You're going to walk through much like you do, you know, for a second floor Cuba Casa or whatever. And you do a floor plan, you just walk around and you just, you know, it, it, it just turn the camera, just turn right. your phone. And then it's going to be able to just take it in a video format of just, just a walkthrough. You're going to do it in five minutes and then it's going to be able to spit out, you know, quote unquote, perfect, you know, right. real estate photography images. We're not there yet, but I, you know, can you imagine that we won't be there in 10 years? Right. Um, you know, so that's where, and, and then I think people point out, well, look, you still need someone to walk in there with, with the phone. And, and, and I know everyone always wants to say that, that realtors, you know, the, the, the people who are marketing it for realtors to do it themselves, you know, there's always going to be that seg segment of realtors who do, but you know, if it gets good, I think it's going to be more attractive to even more realtors. Yeah. And so, you know, and again, it's just that going to be, it's still going to be that challenge to us to then further differentiate ourselves and, and make sure that w the things that we are producing are not going to be able to be made by AI, but I mean, you know, I'm, I'm but, old enough. I'm old enough to remember. I mean, I started shooting in the late eighties, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm old enough to remember what I thought about not just digital cameras at first, but, but cell phone cameras. And right. the idea, the idea that it would be possible for an amateur to take, not just, not just take photographs, but, but take fairly decent photographs with fairly decent resolution that looked mm -hmm. pretty good. The color balance was good. It was framed, framed pretty well. The idea that an amateur could 
could have any kind of repeatability about, you know, taking images that that were above, you know, kind of pedestrian grade was out was mm-hmm. an outrageous thought. And now I, w- I would argue that that, you know, the, the more the more better tools that are put in the hands of people every day and the you know, the, the more the quality of the product is going to go up. So, right. you know, it's a, it's a depressing thought for for working working photographers. Um, but you know, that's, it's the, it's the kind of inevitable slide toward, toward this. I mean, there, don't get me wrong. There is still a fundamental difference between a trained experienced fine art photographer and someone that operates their iPhone. Sure. You know, anyone, anyone, yes. with any amount of experience can, can tell the, tell the two, you know, apart, but that gap is getting considerably yep. closer. Yeah. Yeah. All right. You know what I feel like doing right now is making some money from Zillow. So we're going to take a break <laughs> and um, uh, and then we're going to come back and we're going to have our social media sidebar. We're going to come back. We're going to hear what David's doing at PMRE and then we're going to end with action items. All right. All right. We'll be right back. Aereo has been rolling out new stuff all summer long. So many new things in addition to some big other news. But, you know, so many on the product side, so many new enhancements. We've got mileage, we've got payroll, we've got all this kind of stuff you can do. And I know they're actually rolling out a bunch of new stuff coming this fall as well. We just beta tested uh, a new interface for the listing and the order pages. I'm going to kind of mush all those together and it's going to be so nice. Chelsea walked did a walkthrough the other day and she is not here, but uh, she did tell me it was pretty great. And so we're excited about that. So look, Aereo has all the features that you need to help your real estate media business thrive. Um, we love it. Still using it. Everyone should be. And if you want to try it out and you're a new user, you can get 15 free bonus listings. Oh my goodness. So many bonus listings. Go to Aereo.com, use the code UPMARKET, and every new user gets 15 bonus listings. Fall is in the air, finally. Been a long, hot summer. So you know what that means. It's time to break out the pumpkin spice floor plans. Oh, baby. Second floor app. That's where we can get all kinds of floor plans. And I think pumpkin spice is probably going to be on the menu this fall. I'm excited for that. You know, everyone everywhere always talking about floor plans. It is the number one thing that realtors are now coming to, I think, expect. Uh, it kind of, uh, you know, in all their media and the stuff that they put out there. So one great way that you can get in and you can start providing low costs, low cost, quick floor plans for your clients, the second floor app. I mean, look, they have a really spiffy app. You just walk through and instantaneously you can get a finished floor plan to your realtor. You don't even have to go home and upload it. This technology is so impressive. It's so great. If you want to give it a try, you can get a free month if you go to secondfloorapp.com backslash upmarket. Oh man, you get a free month and you can do all sorts of floor plans. It's so low cost, so efficient. You are going to love Second Floor App. You're not going to infringe on our copyright if you like our show, if you leave a review of our show, if you subscribe to our show. So do an upmarket pod. You know where to find us. Wherever you listen to podcasts, subscribe to that thing. Leave us a five-star review. We love those. Upmarket pod across all any social media that we're on. And um, David, you know, you don't seem like a big social media guy to me, but you know, <laughs> wh- wh- you, you, you out there, where, where can we find you? Um, I, I, everything, um, with a couple exceptions, everything runs through, uh, my, my website, uh, my website for my office, which is, which is my first and last name, uh, all together, all one word. All right. 
deal D E A L. Cool. All right. And then, uh, so then, so do you have a business social media account where you're offering tips for photographers, that kind of thing? Uh, or anything? I, I have a personal, I have a personal Instagram oh, account. Personal. That I okay. Post, post some old photographs. Sure. Uh, but, um, as of right now, we, we, we don't have any social yeah. media that correlates to yeah. our, uh, our website. Okay, cool. Well, I so, so I do like to talk a little bit about social media here, and I do uh, in this segment, and I do have kind of, um, and I don't want to spend too long on it. So if there's a kind of a, a you know a brief way to kind of summarize it, in, in terms when we're talking about. Um, you know, fair use on social media, say we're on Instagram and obviously, you know, we, all of us in this industry have had an instance where a stager or a builder or somebody or a different agent, you know, takes photos that are on the MLS and uploads them, you know, onto their account. And it's pretty clearly egregiously copyright infringement. But what about, you know, the, the legalities of like resharing i mean is that is that kind of the barrier is that kind of the thing that insulates people that because it, and sometimes I, I i get a little annoyed that you know they can reshare it in their stories or whatever and it just has a little you know the little handle of the original poster and they're still getting benefit from it but you know we're not making any money so is, yeah, is that kind of I mean, the way around it yeah i mean what, what you just described happens all the time in my practice i mean i have cases i mean and what you've just described is infringement. <laughs> there is, there is no, I mean, fair use is something that uh, is brought up quite a bit by opposing parties, but really doesn't apply to what you're describing. I mean, fair use is, in the end, it's quite narrow. Um, it means, it, fair use is an affirmative defense. It means, you know, the, the user that is, that is maybe subject uh, or maybe um, maybe the benefit of, of some kind of fair use defense has infringed, right? They've used mm -hmm. they've used the image outside of proper license or permission. Therefore, they've infringed. But you know they may be saved by you know some very narrow uh, circumstances that are described in a fair use defense. I mean, really, when people are when what you described, like a a party that's involved in a shoe. Um, whether or not they were the they were the kind of the, the layout person, uh, a person that contributed to some kind of um, uh, construction of the of the property, when when they copy images that they did not license nor did they receive proper permission from the copyright holder, they're infringing. Um, yeah. But it's always more complicated than that because. Again, like as a photographer, you don't want to you don't want to be in the position where things come back to your client, right? You don't want to be the person right, that reaches right. out to the third parties and says you're infringing, and the and the third party says, well, you know, your client gave me permission to use them. I mean, sure. they didn't like explicitly yeah. say it, but they like you know they they sent me this email mm -hmm. like look at our great images. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times that very yeah. scenario has happened in my practice. So yeah, and you piss off everyone. You piss off everyone if you go after the the, the other third party, you know, right. in, in that situation. Yeah. Right, and I mean that's the. I, I mean, this is. I, I have a variation of this discussion with clients or opposing parties or both on a daily basis, negotiating negotiating this area where. Uh, it is understood, at least by you know my my experience. It's understood by most people that operate in the online universe that there's this there's this like nebulous, weird space where if you have some kind of connection to the content, mm -hmm. it's okay for you to you know just put it on my social media or just share it with somebody. And as photographers, and this is this is. A lot of what I what I plan to talk about at PMRE is is as photographers, we have control over to, to you know to a certain extent. We have we have a lot more control than we think about defining the rules of how our images are used uh, and being proactive in in drafting simple, straightforward documents that put the the limits of is you know almost always the specific limits on on use and license licenses by our original clients it doesn't mean it's not going to happen it doesn't mean that our clients are going to behave badly or they're going to um 
they're going to, without really realizing it, give some kind of implicit permission for third parties to use images and then we have a problem. It doesn't mean that's not going to happen. It just means we want, as photographers, we want to be in the strongest when things hit the fan, we want to be in the strongest position we possibly can by having good, solid, clear language and, and binding documentation that supports our position. Okay. It, it makes, when things do go south, it makes resolving those, those issues easier and better mm -hmm. for, better for photographers. Okay. Yes or no answer to this. If a realtor posts our photos on Instagram and then another realtor not associated with that realtor hits on Instagram, hits the share to stories button. They share it to their stories. Is that infringement? Well, it, that, that issue <laughs> just came up. It was just, it, it was just a, mm -hmm. a issue before uh, a court in the, in the ninth circuit, which includes California. Mm -hmm. The ninth circuit held that that is not infringement. So okay. it is, and, and I'll back up just a second because the current issue is not resolved law. It is, it is a subject of a circuit split, which just means there are, there are a number of different um, circuits in the U.S. court system, not, not state courts, but the federal court system, there, is, there, is, there are a collection of circuits. The Ninth Circuit happens to be the one with California. It, it holds a mm -hmm. lot of weight because, because of its population and the fact that all the tech companies are out there, and it, it usually leads the way. That doesn't mean that all the other circuits have to adopt that that holding absent a mm -hmm. Supreme Court uh, decision on the exact same subject matter. So the Ninth Circuit has held that as long as the, the, the third party user is using the embedding function of Instagram mm -hmm. or Facebook or Pinterest or mm -hmm. and it is they, they, meaning the third party, is not the party that is actually making a copy. All they're doing is utilizing the function on the Instagram uh, website that allows for code mm -hmm. to be embedded in the new site that as a result displays the image. Now, between the two of us, I happen to think that's bullshit, but that, that is, <laughs> Ninth Circuit has, has held mm -hmm. that, that that does not embedding a link by a third party does not constitute infringement. All right. That was a long way of saying no, <laughs> but that we, <laughs> well, <laughs> right. Well, when you ask a lawyer, right. Oh, you ask a question. It's a yes or no question. Well, wait, it depends. <laughs> that, that is the actual answer, right? Um, <laughs> all right. Well, thank you for settling that ninth circuit. Uh huh. Right. All right. Anyway, we're going to come right back. We're going to hear more about PMRE and we're going to end with action items. Just a sec. All right, so David, I I feel like I have a flavor already of what you're going to talk about at PMRE, but can you go over it and don't give away the whole deal because I want people to pay and come to this and come to Las Vegas. So, but g give us the nutshell of what's um, of what's going on. Sure, um, I will. I'll be speaking about best practices for photographers concerning their copyright, and that means best practices concerning. Um, proactively uh, protecting their copyright, meaning uh, drafting and using documents that, um, let's say, prior to capturing images that are subject to copyright, uh, good, legal, clear documents that, uh, that support uh, their, their position, meaning they're the copyright holders, the license are clearly defined, as well as um, best practices for uh, addressing and handling copyright infringement matters when they occur, um, meaning what to do and what not to do when you discover an infringement, uh, whether or not, you know, what, what the threshold is for uh, enlisting an attorney versus trying to handle things yourself, and, and then kind of 
some best practices for, I guess, kind of in between, meaning uh, developing a developing a, a good, healthy relationship with the copyright office and developing a, a workflow that includes regi- mm-hmm. regularly registering your work in groups that will, when properly done, put a photographer in a much stronger position mm-hmm. should not yeah. of infringements take place. Right. Yeah. And, 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 you know, we, we've definitely tried that, um, tried that, you know, workflow of, of, of getting their stuff copyrighted, but man, that is a, that is a tough workflow. And, and I commend anyone who's able to do it. And I'm, I'm really hoping that one day soon ish, and I know how glacial these things can be, um, to have a better, easier system for registering work, because I think it's, it's very onerous as, as it is now, at least according to our office manager, who is the one who did it because I (laughs) didn't want to do it myself. Uh, (laughs) Um, so, uh, okay. So it's, there's going to be a lot of like really practical advice in your talk. It sounds like, I mean, we're going to be able to walk away from this with a, with a real better understanding of, of, of how we can protect ourselves. Um, and then are you going to get into some of these more uh, hot button things like AI and, you know, all that, all yeah. that kind of stuff? Oh, absolutely. I mean, AI um, is is on everyone's mind. Anyone that reads any kind of headlines, you know, just in just in the past six months, the the AI has gone from, you know, almost almost nothing to a dominant issue. I happen to think that it that it it has it's 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 going to be a less it's going to have less of an impact on photographers than we may think, but it, but it's still something that, that we all have to address. I I'll, I'll go over at least my perspective on what to expect and how it, how it may affect photographers, specifically uh, photographers in, in our niche in, in, in real estate niche. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, you know, how, uh, what's your take, you know, and I, and in obviously you're someone who makes a living doing this, but I mean, you know, what are the kind of, when we decide, when we do have a copyright infringement, you know, how are we deciding when to go after that? You know, when to make a, you know, when to make a a claim is the wrong word, but you know, when to press a case, you know, when to, to do that. Because I think sometimes you're probably better off not doing it and, and more of taking the, the tack of, of education. And I just had one with a local realtor. They just like just flat out reposted stuff uh, on their Instagram. And I just messaged them and said, Hey, you know, you know, we're not litigious. This is something that we could sue over. We're, we really want to educate. We really want to help grow our, you know, help our community, blah, blah, blah. And I, and I think that came off much better. Whereas if I had gone scorched earth and just said, Hey, you infringed, you owe us thousands of dollars. I mean, you know, there's no way that guy would ever use this. And I live in a small town and it just would be a disaster. Right. right? So, yeah. And, and that is, I mean, this is this, what you just described is the underlying issue in, in, I I mean, I'll say every matter that comes across my desk concerning a real estate or architectural photographer, 100% of the time, there, there is this just below the surface issue of how, how the best kind of path, what the best path to take is for the photographer and my office, even, even after a photographer has made a decision that it's in his or her best interest to hire an attorney because they either don't want to confront the, the infringer directly or it's touchy or or they want to go scorched earth, there's there's still this underlying issue about um, what and and what the issue will do to the existing relationship between the photographer and his or her client. Right. There's some photographers that are starting out and 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 want to preserve these relationships at all costs. There are other photographers that are at the at the the kind of the end of their their professional arc and don't care. So it just it it just depends. Um, But, yeah, I mean, we'll we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that plenty kind of the and kind of in on a on a practical uh, level. If you are going to attempt to solve the problem without, without hiring counsel, what to do and what not to do, because it matters. Right. You know, what you say, right. how you approach the situation, the language you use, absolutely, you know, a lot of non-attorneys don't believe me or don't, don't, don't want to believe me. It matters. Um, you know, right. I, I'll give you kind of a, a summary of 
a conversation I've had a million times with a new client, including this morning, you know, where where a, a client, a photographer calls me up and says, I got this issue. I'm new to this. I, I can't believe this person used my images. And this is what I did. I reached out to them. I said, Oh, you can, you know, I'm sure it was a problem. I'm sure it was a mistake, but you know, let's, let's just say you, you, you pay me a hundred bucks and I'll, we'll call it a day. If that solves the problem and everyone's happy, then that's great. But if it doesn't solve the problem, the photographer has put him or herself in a position where their attorney has to has to dig them out of this position where they value right. their work at a hundred dollars when it's worth you know twenty grand. So that's right. that's th- that's a really good example, practical example of these little things that you know I'm going to speak about what to do and what not to do. Uh, you know, with, with the bigger picture in mind. Right, right, right. Well, that's going to be really practical because I think that's, you know, we're all a little bit in the dark on that and, and, you know, you just kind of go by feel and, and I've, I've done a version of that, you know, where it's like, oh, you, you know, I, although I said a hundred bucks an image to, to, there was a hated realtor in our area and they, he used like six of mine on Instagram and I'm like, (laughs) so he he ended up paying me three, 300 bucks, uh, you know, so it was, it was, and, and, and it was good, uh, petty vindication. So, um, you know, I, I, I felt good about that. Um, so, all right, well, chock full of, of, um, uh, and then, so, and are you going to be hanging out? Are you just, are you, you know, are you busy enough that you're just going to like jet in to Las Vegas gonna, and be there at 10 a.m.? The you're going to get on stage at 11. Oh, you're going to be there. The I'm going to be there for the whole conference. Yeah. I live in, I live in Virginia. <laughs> if I'm going to make a trip, I'm going to be there. And, and you know, I want to, I want to be there to experience the conference anyway. Uh, you know, so yeah, I'll be there for the whole conference. I might even be there a night early. Oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. I, I'm definitely going to be there night early. Well, the pre-registration parties, uh, you know, kind of one of the fun parties yeah. for sure. You know, the, the night before, you know, it's when everyone, I mean, that's kind of that, that first, you know, Mark and I went for the first time a, a couple of years ago and that was the night we, we partied, uh, hard, you know, we were <laughs> hanging out with the air, with the, with the aerial crew and we were up late and, you know, and then by the, by the, by the big party night, we we're like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm a little tired, you know? So, uh, you know, that's always the thing in Las Vegas. It's, it's hard not to just go hard as soon as you get there <laughs> yeah. and then you're kind of you know, playing catch up, playing catch up the rest of the time. Yeah. So, um, well, that's great. Well, David, you know, uh, this is great. And, and I do want to end with some action items. And so I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go first. Cause mine is actually, I've been trying to, have our action items be kind of with our, with our topic kind of, uh, of the podcast, but this one is not, I'm, I'm going left field on this. So this is more in the, in the guise of client relations and, and, and it actually could be a good way to, to make sure, you know, to, to keep communication going with your clients in a way that, that does make it easier to, even if you ever have to have a copyright, um, uh, uh conversation with the client, you've already cemented this good relationship. So it's going to be easier, but I want you to send a client a handwritten note. Um, I just got one from one of our clients and it was really nice. And, and he had actually suggested to me that he sends his clients, you know, four times a year, he'll send them a handwritten note. Now we can't do, we have like 500 clients. We're not going to be able to do that. But I think the occasional handwritten note is going to go a long way towards, you know, you're going to stick out in the crowd. No one is writing handwritten notes anymore. So if you can write a note, there's a little card to a client, maybe, maybe you send a, a note on their birthday every year, you do, do something, um, or even just one, that's my action item is just do one and maybe invite your client out to lunch, you know, wh- whatever it is, send them a handwritten note. I think that's going to, that's going to help grow your business. Um, do you want, do you want mine? Yeah, oh, go okay. for it. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. I'm ready. So, um, you know, we'll, uh, you know, there'll, there'll be more details at the conference, but you know, my action item is every photographer should sit down and, and end up with a, a number of very simple documents that, that clearly define their relationships with their clients. Um, there's, there should be a document that oh, is, yeah. is the default agreement between uh, the photographer and their client. It doesn't mean it can't be changed, but it's, but it's kind of the starting point that includes language that is most likely to be, to be um, maintained and, and held at the, in the, in the contract. And then, um, you know, another document that, that, uh, you know, a, a simple document that goes over 
the license options and the licensing, the third party licensing uh, options for for a shoot. Those two things alone, uh, in addition to putting the matter in writing and in front of your client prior to the shoot, it 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 forces a photographer and hopefully a client to think very concretely about what those what you know kind of what what the what the rules are going to be um it's mm-hmm. it's it's just a better easy way of doing business uh than uh, compared to making the assumption that the parties are in agreement about these things and not discussing them at all uh right, and right. the more you operate as a photographer the more you operate from that standpoint uh of having a written document that kind of does the talking for you that you can submit to a client, the more you start operating that way. And, and that's, that's going to, that's going to, in the end, be, be a, not only a time saver, but is going to, is going to benefit the photographer when there are legal matters that, that are in dispute. Right. Right. All right. That is awesome. David, thank you so much. I, I'm looking forward to your presentation at the conference and I'm looking forward to meeting you in person and hanging out. I think this is, you know, we're going to have a, a blast in Las Vegas and man, you are a wealth of information that uh, I know everyone's going to be able to, to utilize. So thank you so much. All right, then thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you at PMRE. And if not, you'll hear us uh, in a couple of weeks when we have our next podcast. All right. Thank you. Upmarket is a production of Upmarket Studios. This episode was produced by Chelsea Froelich and edited by Bethany Diedrich. Thank you so much for listening, and we really hope you listen to the next one too. In the meantime, our wish for you is to not have to shoot any Friday night Twilight shoots. Thank you for everything. Thank you.